1968, legendary filmmaker, actor, and comedian Mel Brooks made his feature film debut with the producers. The movie is revered as a comedy masterpiece, and Brooks, coming off several years as a successful television writer, even won the Academy Award for Best Original Screenplay. The movie is about a scheme by failing Broadway producer Max Bialystok and his accountant Leo Bloom. In a serendipitous moment, Bloom realizes that a Broadway show that disastrously flops could actually be more profitable to its producer than a show that's a runaway success, albeit illegally. You see? Do you see what I'm trying to tell you? You could have raised a million dollars, put on a $60,000 flop, and kept the rest. But what if the play was a hit? Well, then you'd go to jail. The duo purchased a script called Springtime for Hitler, which has a name alone that should offend most of its potential audience. They hire an eccentric cross-dressing director and awful actors. But things don't work out as they expect. Where did I go right? Springtime for Hitler becomes a smash hit. While the movie may be regarded as a classic today, The Producers was actually not a box office success. Its appeal to audiences grew in the 1970s and 80s through television airings and the then fledgling home video market. This was a time Brooks reached the height of his popularity with moviegoers with hits such as Young Frankenstein and Blazing Saddles. The Producers truly hit the big time in 2001 when it became the biggest show on Broadway. While it may seem obvious looking back, Mel Brooks actually had to be persuaded to adapt a movie about making a Broadway flop into a Broadway hit. The show would win a record 12 Tonys. After successful runs in New York and London, and on national and worldwide tours, it was decided that the new musical version of the producers deserved the Hollywood treatment. Mel Brooks, the creative mind behind both the original movie and Broadway show, was on board to write and produce. Susan Storman, the director and choreographer of the Broadway show, was on board to direct. And original Broadway stars Nathan Lane and Matthew Broderick reprised their roles as Bialy Stock and Bloom. This seemed like the perfect formula for success, but 2005's producers, the movie musical, is just not well adapted back to the silver screen. Movie audiences don't particularly care for musicals like they used to. Songs in a musical are meant to convey emotion, when that emotion is too big to express in other ways. That doesn't work well with modern movie audiences that tend to take what they see literally. So groups of people spontaneously breaking into song and dance just doesn't look right in a movie that otherwise acts like it's just another day in New York. Nathan Lane and Matthew Broadwick are fine actors, but neither holds a candle to Zero Mostel and Gene Wilder. Mostel and Wilder play their roles a little goofy, but for the most part, they let the situations around them and the writing make the audience laugh. In the remake, Lane and Broadwick appear to be impersonating Mostel and Wilder, plus they overact. It's a stage technique that helps the audience realize the mood of the scene when the sets are small and much more limited. But this is a movie, not a play. The remake also gives a bigger part to the secretary, Ula. In the original, Lee Meredith appears in just two scenes, mainly to be eye candy. She's supposed to be a frivolous expense made by Bialystok. She also adds some small contributions to the comedy. In the remake, Uma Thurman is given third billing. She makes multiple appearances throughout the movie, including her own musical number, and becomes Bloom's love interest. The expanded role offers no real contribution to the plot or humor, so the character becomes rather annoying as the movie goes on. One of the stranger changes in the remake is Franz Liebkin. Kenneth Mars gives a brilliant performance as a crazy Nazi writer springtime for Hitler. He's obviously not right in the head, and presumably shell-shocked after fighting for the Third Reich in World War II. Mars perfectly locks the line of appearing crazy without acting silly. Will Ferrell takes over the role in the remake, and he's, well, very Will Ferrell. He just plays Liebkin as a crazy Nazi-obsessed idiot. He's comic relief in a comedy. Liebkin is also cast as Hitler in the play. This eliminates the character Lorenzo Saint Dubois, better known as Alsti, a great character from the original who's cast to play Hitler, but too contemporary flower child to be believable in 2005. Alsti's portrayal of Hitler is what makes people think they're seeing a comedy and turns the play into a hit. In the remake, Liebkin can't play Hitler because on opening night he breaks his leg after a song about why entertainers say break a leg instead of good luck. A poor irony joke. He plays eccentric director takes over the role. He then accidentally turns springtime for Hitler into a comedy with his performance. The direction of the remake leaves much to be desired. Like Brooks when he directed the original, the remake is Susan Storman's first feature film. Unfortunately, there's a reason it remains her only movie directing credit. She's a brilliant Tony award-winning stage director, but that may be the problem. She directs a movie like a Broadway show. Comedy is all about timing. A funny gag, or even just a line, can fail if it's not delivered correctly. The timing on stage doesn't necessarily adapt to the screen. On stage, the comedy is written, directed, and rehearsed and performed around a live audience's reaction. It's also the same for dance numbers and songs. When a stage actor performs an incredible dance or sings a strong solo, the audience generally shows their delight with applause. Movie audiences do not react the same as stage audiences. Moviegoers will laugh out loud at something that's funny, 
but don't often applaud during a movie. Movie audiences are generally smart enough to know that the actors on film cannot see or hear their reactions. Storman decided to faithfully adapt the producer's musical numbers and gags with the pauses for the audience to laugh and share. While it's obvious that a lot of care went into the remake of the producers, all that care was done to keep the movie faithful to the stage version. When the 1968 original was adapted to the stage, plenty of changes were made to consider that there are differences between the stage and screen. Unfortunately, those differences were not taken into consideration when adapting the play back to the screen. And that's why the 2005 version of The Producers is an awful remake. Leo and Max, up off our backs, back on the great wide way. Leo and Max, back on our tracks, we're back on top to stay. So when we 